2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We've talked about uh, another spirit. Another Jesus is what we started with. Verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguile Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Do you think it's possible that church people can have their minds corrupted? Church people. I didn't, I didn't say necessarily saved people. Saved people can get into nonsense every now and then, and the Holy Ghost will whip them out of it. Okay? It's just like children get into every man, every man. But church people are getting their minds corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And I don't think I've touched on that, but I might deal with that when we come to the gospel part of it. Um, the gospel is supposed to be simple. Who got saved at a young age? Here. Cubby, you did. Helen, Melissa, I did. Nine years old. And uh, I think Melissa beat me, though. Five. Five. At Rockport Baptist Church. Yep. I remember it when she was baptized. I had to stand on blocks to get baptized. Huh? I had to stand on blocks. I know it, because I went up there after the baptism, and I looked in there, to, and there was a cinder block in there, that, and I thought the preacher stood on it so he didn't get wet. I thought he stood on the block so he wouldn't get wet. That's what I thought. But anyway... Um, it's supposed to be simple enough that children, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. So it's supposed to be simple enough that a child can understand that. And uh, children do. Children get it sometimes better than adults do. But anyway, um, we get into the gospel part, we might look into some of the, the ways that the devil makes salvation complicated. He, he'll draw people away from the simplicity of it. For if he, verse 4, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So what we're going to do this morning <clears throat> is we're going to put the spirit on trial. Okay? Um, up on the screen here is 1 Corinthians 12.10, make sure that's up there, 1 Corinthians 12.10, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the discerning of the Spirit, being able to discern spirits, whether they be of God or not. 1 John 4.1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. When, uh, years ago, when I <clears throat> started studying certain things in the Bible, like Bible numbers and so on, I, I didn't want to study them because, I mean, I knew enough about the occult, the occult, the, all the pagans and the devil worshippers and all these people, they used numerology. And that was their thing. If the numbers come up right, that's, that has to do with divination and all that. And I didn't want anything to do with that. I was kind of, I was leery of it. And, um, but I just felt impressed to study it, so I tried that spirit, because I said, if that's true, then it's going to be in the Bible. God's going to say it. He's going to say it very plainly, and he's going to tell us about numbers. And so the, the easiest way to test spirits or to put spirits on trial, weigh it against the evidence, Match it up against, how can you tell if you've got funny money in your hand? How can you tell if you've got funny money? Measure it up against the real thing. Okay, the real thing has got marks and little insignias in it, and they put all kinds of stuff now, money, to keep people from reproducing money. And so you just match it up with the real thing, and then you know it by the fruit that it produces. So in Luke chapter 6, turn there. Luke 6, Matthew 7... Okay, Luke 6, 43, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, 
Neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Let me just say it like it's in my mind. I believe the Bible that we believe in is the Word of God. Can I hear you say amen? Okay, that was your morning amen. That's good, that's good wake up amen. It will and it cannot produce any evil fruit. It cannot. It is not capable of it. It, it, it always produces good fruit in the life of the person who believes it. It doesn't do much of anything for someone who doesn't believe it. But it does produce good fruit in the life of someone who will accept it, who will believe it, that even if they don't understand. Nancy, do you understand every verse in the Bible? I don't either. You don't understand it, and yet you believe it. You don't question it. You say, God, I don't understand this verse, but I know that what you said is true, and so you'll give me an answer when you're ready to give me an answer. I'll trust you. I'll wait on you. And I'll, I'll let you be the teacher. And so, a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. And Matthew seven eighteen says the same thing. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It's a double witness. Both are talking about the same thing. But likewise, a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. It is impossible. Uh, I mentioned uh, this many times. There was a, a farmer that I know <clears throat> that he had on his property close to his house out in a little cow pasture he had a, he had a pear tree and I like pears and um, I said brother Clarence I said man that tree out there is loaded down with pears I said are you going to eat those because I was hinting around for him to give me some he said you can have all you want I said really he said yeah but they ain't fit to eat so why not he said when you look at them you'll see it and they're tough you can't hardly bite into them and I don't know, but anyway, we went out there, and he shook that tree. And these pears started falling down, and they were all gnarled looking. They weren't right looking. And they, I mean, they were tough as shoe leather. And he said, that tree has never produced good pears. Never has. But he said, you watch this. He shook that tree, and he gave out a little bellow, and he calls his cows in for feeding. And they come over there, and boy, they just chewed them up. They love him. He said, cows love him. He said, I leave it there, let cows eat them. He said, but we don't touch them. We don't, there's nothing there that we ever got from them. And that is right. A good, a corrupt tree cannot ever produce good fruit. So, I mean, I had people ask me, I had people ask me this all the time. So, are you saying, brother, that every, all the, everybody uses all these other Bibles, are they not going to heaven? Here's what I'm going to tell you. At one time, I didn't use the King James. I was trying to use the NIV in my study. I, I tried to bring it out in, in a Sunday school class one time and got in trouble over it. Okay? Somebody didn't like it, and they let me know they didn't like it. So it's confusion. And that kind of that kind of made me mad a little bit. But they were right. But I was at one time I was going to favor these other Bibles. At one time. When I was out at Richwoods, I bought a whole big box of NIVs and was giving them out to people that got saved. <laughs> Dummy me. Okay? And what I'm going to tell you is, let God worry about who's going to heaven. Okay? Let God worry about what is in somebody's future. There may be people all over the place right now that are using strange Bibles that God is going to let them go for a while and then He's going to bring them to the truth. It is not our place... To go around point and fix. Now, when it comes to people that I will and will not listen to, if it's a preacher and he's not using the King James, I won't listen to him. I just, I won't. I don't trust what comes out of his mouth. I don't trust it. Maybe he's a good guy. I don't know. People send me books. First thing I check is, does it use King If it don't use King James, I probably won't read it, except maybe to use it as an example was why you should not read this book or why you should not follow this person or whatever. But I just, you know, people send me YouTube videos. Boy, Pastor, I know they don't use the King James, but I probably won't watch it, okay? It's because I just don't trust it. I've been lied to. I mean, been lied to, amen? Been lied to so many times, I just don't trust that. And so anyway, it, I, I got a book one time. I, I thought this was the strangest, oddest thing in the world to believe in. 
And I got this book, and I looked at it, and I thought, oh my goodness. But I started looking at the scriptures the guy was writing in there. I'll call him back later. Okay? I started looking at the scriptures, and they were all King James. I went, okay, I'm going to go through, and I'm going to read every verse a scripture out of this guy's book. And I read all the verses of scripture and then I looked at what the guy was saying. I'm going, he's saying, I think he's saying it right. And so anyway, let God be true and every man a liar. I do not think that these false Bibles in a church will ever produce good fruit. Look in and examine now the testimony and the witness of churches all over Jefferson County. Look at what's going on. Look at, look at the community that we live in. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. And yet Jefferson County, Missouri has one of the highest methamphetamine rates in the, in the country. We used to be the number one drug man, methamphetamine drug manufacturing county in the United States of America. We slipped to number two or three. Praise the Lord. Or maybe we're, just, we're still putting out the same amount. It's just somebody beat us. But anyway, the churches of our area, if they are not using the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, they cannot bring forth incorruptible fruit. It is impossible for that to happen. Now, turn to Genesis chapter 2. God shows you a contrast. A contrast. Genesis 2, verse 9. Out of the ground. Nine is the number for what? What's the number nine stand for? How many months does a woman hold a baby in her belly? Nine. Come on, the room's full of women. Nine. nine. So nine is the number for bearing fruit. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. So Genesis 2 verse 9, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I like to, you know, I look at this, I say one is the tree of life, the other obviously is the tree of death. Because God said, if you eat of that tree, ye shall surely die. So it, it produced, one produces life and one produces death. It's that simple. The tree of life can never produce death. The tree of death, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, cannot produce life. It cannot do it. All it can do is produce and bring forth death into the world. Both of them were in the midst of the garden. Which means that God gave man a choice. And He still gives man a choice. It is ours to choose what tree... We want to eat from. Some, all they want is secret knowledge, occult knowledge. All they want is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's all they want. They do not want everlasting life. They want what this world can bring them. They're choosing death. There are those of us who only want everlasting life in heaven does not matter what we can achieve or attain to in this world. It matters to us that we attain eternal life. So we choose the tree of life. But God clearly gives man a choice between the two. That right there is the simplicity. It's not choice number one or choice number 483. We don't have all these other choices, all these other paths. It's just one simple decision. Are you going to follow Christ? You're going to follow the devil. Galatians chapter 5. Turn there. This is your nine fruits of the Spirit. In fact, turn to Galatians 5. Because in Galatians 5, you have the fruits of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh. Galatians 5. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, number one, is love. Let me stop right here. If you have somebody that you know, that you know you must love them, but it is hard to love them, say amen. 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 Okay? You cannot 
produce love for somebody when you hate their guts. Can't do it. God then gives you love for them as a free gift to you. This is a, this are, these are the gifts of the Spirit. They're free. Absolutely free. Paul said, in, uh, if you look over very quickly, in Galatians 3... Back to that. In Galatians 3, verse 2, This only what I learned of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. What's the answer to that? How did they get the Spirit? The hearing of faith. They didn't perform works. They didn't, they didn't fulfill the law to get the Spirit. It was, done, it was received by faith. It was a free gift given to them. So, if you are having issues where you know you're supposed to love somebody... In your flesh, you cannot produce the love for them. Call upon God who gives to all men liberally, the Bible says. He'll give you a gift of love. And it'll, what happened is you'll manifest love in you or God will bring forth the fruit of love in you. And you find yourself loving that person and giving to that person and doing for that person even though you hated their guts. Even though they've never done anything good to you, you ended up doing things for them. And that is God producing the gift of love in you. And you have to say, that wasn't me, that was the Holy Ghost. God gave that to me. Okay? That's how it works. Joy. You're looking for joy in life. You cannot produce or manufacture joy. It's, it, and if you do, it's going to be fake. It's going to be phony. It's going to be a big front for everybody. You cannot produce it. God is the one who puts that in you. Peace. If you want peace in your heart and you can't produce it. Let God put it in you. God will give you peace. Amen. I'm telling you, I've been with these people who died. I've been with them days before they died, 24 hours before they died. I was with Lee Walsh, and God gave him a peace that just came over him. I was with, um, 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 I'm trying to think of his name. Brother Fiedler, you sit up here. The, I mean, within an hour of him dying, I was with him in, the, in, the, in his hospital room, and I was there with his family, and all of a sudden, he just blurted out. He said, I just want everybody to know in this room that if anything happens to me, I know where I'm going. I know I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus, and I have, I have no doubt about it whatsoever in my life. And of course, I'm just trying to, I'm going, okay, I don't want the family to think he's dead here, okay? So all, you know, don't worry about that, you know. And I'm, I'm not kidding you, in an hour that man was standing before God. Okay? But he, he had a peace about it. He just blurted it out. He said, I just want everybody to know I'm going to heaven when I die. Amen! Okay? Man, that man had it. Amen. These are gifts. These are God producing and producing the fruit in your life and you bearing the fruit. But something I learned, God does not command you to produce the fruit. Only to bear it. You can't produce it. And if you did, it only lasts this long. When you're real sad, you might be able to put a smile on your face for about a minute, and then it's wiped away. You can't do it. God can do that for you. Long-suffering. To have long-suffering with people. Gentleness. Goodness with people. Faith. Faith is a gift from God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Meekness. Yielding your rights. In areas where we do not want to yield our rights, we yield our rights. We give ourselves, we, we let God have a situation instead of us taking over. Temperance, which means that you have the ability to endure. You have the ability to endure. Tempered glass, tempered steel produces what? When they temper something, what happens to it? It's stronger. It has the ability to, to uh, endure things that it would not, you would have cracked away a long time ago had it not been for God producing temperance in your life. The way the new Bibles say this, I hate it. It makes me angry every time I hear it. According to them, the ninth fruit of the Spirit is self-control. I do not like that term, self-control. Okay? Because, number one, I have none. Okay? Especially when it comes to donuts. Okay? But it's temperance. It is God working in you and God controlling you and giving you a long-suffering, giving you an endurance that you did not have before. Our forefathers were burnt at the stake for believing this Bible. Yes. Don't ask me if I want to have that happen to me. Don't ask me that. 
Because I can tell you flat out, I can choose 99 million other ways to die than to be burned alive in front of everybody. But God gave them endurance. God gave them the ability to do this. And He will you. He will. He'll do it for you. Let's look at the opposite of that. Turn back to Galatians 5.19. By the way, there's nine fruits of the Spirit. There are 18 works of the flesh. Dun, dun, dun. 18 is nine times two. It is also six plus six plus six. Dun, dun, dun. Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery. Did you know adultery comes natural? It's in the natural man. It's natural. It's in there. You don't have to... God, no, the devil does not have to gift you with, a, with the gift of adultery. Whereas you didn't have it before. It's there automatically. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. First four of these deal with uh, sins of adulthood. Okay? And they come naturally. They are in your inner being. They are the no good thing that Paul said in Romans 7. They are the works of the flesh. They are not the gifts of the Spirit. Now, here's, here's something I want you to ponder this. The real Spirit of God will manifest these nine fruits. It, the Spirit of God in you will be manifested, and it is the manifest token of God's Spirit dwelling in you. Here are the nine, or the eighteen, works of the flesh. If a church, or a ministry, or let's say a minister, or any, any kind of uh, religious structure, religious organization, or whatever, and, and what is manifest of them is any of these things. It is not the Holy Spirit of God. It is not the Spirit of God. That's what he said. When you, when you go to test spirits, look at what's being produced by that Spirit. By their fruit, ye shall know them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Worshipping an image of something rather than God. Witchcraft, which is the opposite religion of the gospel. Witchcraft requires a work, it requires a performance, it requires um, a ritual of, of various kinds, it requires using sacred words or secret words or whatever, but it's witchcraft. Witchcraft and rebellion go together, always. Idolatry and stubbornness go together. Alright? So witchcraft, hatred. Anybody who has a hatred of anybody else, that's, the, that is the, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. It is the work of the flesh. It's manifest that when hatred comes out of them, let's say that um, you got a church, supposedly they're, they're Bible-believing and then all this and that, and yet manifested out of them, is, I'll just go ahead and give you the example. Uh, Stephen... Um, What's his name down in Arizona? Stephen Anderson. He's got this little storefront church down there. He's, he uses King James Bible, but he's one of these guys that says, if you've, if you've ever committed a homosexual sin, you're, God hates you. He's the one that protests and says, God hates you. You're not ever going to heaven. God hates you and I hate you. And he uses all these slurs for these people, okay? Now I know it's true in some cases, but not all cases. I know it because I've seen it, I've experienced it. That man I led to the Lord, his, his life was renewed, he wanted to go to heaven, he knew what he was doing wrong, he knew the lifestyle he was living was wrong, and he confessed his sins. As far as I'm concerned, the man's in heaven, okay? But that's hatred, that is a work of the flesh. It is not an indication of the Spirit of God. It's not a fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Will you love people? Will you love people that are sinners? Will you love people that do things that are contrary to God's Word? Will you love things that God says, people that, that do things that God says is an abomination? Will you love them? Okay? 
Hatred. Variance, which means to change. They're all about, let's change this, let's change that, let's be variable about this, let's, let's change everything. They're always changing. Emulations, which is like a rivalry. Your neighbor puts up a white picket fence that's four feet tall. And you say, well, he's not going to get away with that. So you put up a white picket fence that's six feet tall. Just so that everybody can be looking. You've got a little rivalry going on with your neighbor. You're emulating them. Wrath. Pouring out wrath. Strife. Always striving with people. There's always a fight in your life. You're always fighting somebody. Seditions. Okay? That's a, that, that is a, a treacherous or being a traitor to things. Heresies. Having doctrines that are in direct contradiction to the Word of God. Envyings. Wanting to be like people on TV. Wanting to be like rock and roll stars. Wanting to dress like them. That's the work of the flesh. When girls and or boys go around walking around. Boys go around with their pants pulled down to their knees. That is envying. They're envying the thugs that they see. With, who's the, on the rap videos. Okay. When the girls go around dressed like little harlots. That is envying. Murders, drunkenness, whether it's physical drunkenness or spiritual drunkenness. I'll tell you what, any church where you go and you hear them say, now listen, boy, boy, he's drunk in the spirit, amen. You get out of there. You leave that place. They, they, God tried to lay his hands on me. He said, Hoggard, it's obvious that you've not been drunk in the spirit. I said, Don't, and he went, I said, don't you touch me. I can impart that to you. Don't you, you get away from me. Drunken in the spirit. Revelings. Where the church service, uh, the Pensacola outpouring, the uh, Assembly of God Church down in uh, Pensacola, Florida, had, this, had these manifestations where a spirit blew through these, this church night after night, night after night. It was a constant, it was every night. And this went on for months. And hundreds of people showed up every night. And they would have these revelings of a church service. Pandemonium. People convulsing. People laid out in the aisles. Hollering and screaming and convulsing all over the place. Like, like animals, like drunks. And they're saying that was the Holy Ghost. People whose minds were, they were so drunk in the spirit, they couldn't complete sentences. And there's video evidence of this. That is not the fruit of the Spirit. It is not a manifestation of the Spirit of God. Amen. It is a reveling and such like. That's the 18th one. Anything like any of these whatsoever. Of the which I tell you before as I've told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You think the Bible means what it says. Okay. So in your life, which is better? Fruit of the Spirit, works of the flesh. Okay? In your life, you will want the fruit of the Spirit, including the Spirit of meekness. It's something we all struggle with. Something makes us mad. We want to start throwing our fits, stomping our feet, yelling and screaming to get our way. I struggle with it. Other people struggle with it. It's when you... Let me, give you, let me give you an example. Moses. When Miriam and Aaron came to Moses and they said, you take too much on you. Maybe you think that God only speaks to you. Well, maybe God speaks to the rest of us too. How's that? It was, it was Miriam and Aaron. It was Miriam, his own sister, and Aaron, his own brother, came to him. But we find out that Miriam, his sister, was the one really leading the band there. And Moses, instead of lashing back and saying, look, I'm in charge. Get out of my face. The Bible says that Moses was more meek than any man. And he backed away and he went to the Lord and he told the Lord what happened. And the Lord said, well, okay, this is simple. I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill Miriam. And uh, Moses begged for her. And beg for her life. And 
the bottom line is Miriam ended up being struck, I think, with leprosy or something like that. Anyway, she was put out for about a week and made an example. And God came out and he told everybody, he said, look, he said, if I'm going to say something to a prophet, he said, I'll do it by a, by a dream, a night vision, or something else. But it's not so with Moses. If I have something to say with Moses, I say it to him face to face. So the bottom line is, when I get ready to talk, I'm going to talk to one man, and that is Moses. Okay? Now, God on that day exalted Moses. But Moses, watch this, did not exalt himself. And he had a right to, but he didn't. Abraham, the same thing. Abraham, in, in Genesis 13, this even before his name was Abraham, it was Abram back then. And Lot's herdsmen began to strive with Abram's herdsmen. And Abram could have said to Lot, look, practically everything you have is because I gave it to you. You guys are infringing on my wells, they're my wells, they're my pasture ground, and technically, I could even say they're my servants and they're my sheep, but I gave them to you. And so here's what's going to happen. You decide which way you want to go. If you go one way, I'll go the other. If you go north, I'll go south. Because not, we don't want, we don't want the lost world seeing us fight together, so we're going to part company. And he, but he said, I'm going to give you your choice. Wherever you want to go, that's where you're going to go. The Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew 5, He said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If you go read Genesis 13, you'll see it. Lot chose the plains, the grasslands, the well-watered plains. And he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And God then took Abram. And he said, Now Abram, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. How far is that? Infinity. And he said, all that your eyes have set upon, I will give that to thee. Abram literally inherited the earth. And Lot lost everything when God destroyed Sodom. Lost his wife. He lost the sons of his two daughters. He lost, he, and even after that, his own daughters had to get him drunk so they, they could produce seed from their father to carry on. Sickening. Okay? But not so with Abraham. And if we could just get it in our mind, God, you settle the fights, you settle the arguments, God, you settle things between me and somebody else. God, help me to exhibit meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It takes more strength to keep your mouth shut than it does to say certain things. Okay? These are fruits of the Spirit. Either God produces them in you or He doesn't. You cannot produce them yourself. You cannot manufacture them yourself. And if you do, it's only going to last for a little while, and then you're going to be right back where you were, and everybody's going to see who you really are. Now, I'm not saying these things to just chastise everybody, but the lost world is looking at us church people. Are they not? They may not know much about God, but they know what the works of the flesh are because their life is full of it. And when we act like lost people, lost people don't see a difference between us and them. And they don't want what we have. Because they see us as a bunch of fake, phony, fraudulent church members who are saying, once you come to our church, and in their mind is, they just want our money. And in some cases, they're not wrong. So let's exhibit to this world, to our lost friends, our lost family members, our lost co-workers, even to the people you buy gas from. Let's exhibit to them the fruits of the Spirit, the real ones. And if you don't have the real Spirit of God in you, you can't, they will not be manifested in you. I promise you they won't be. All right? Father in heaven, give us discernment. Give us wisdom, Father. Help us to test the spirits to see whether they be of you. Father, everybody has a choice. Everybody can choose, Lord, what spirit they want in them. Father, I want the Holy Spirit. I want the, the Spirit who is from the words that are in this book. 
I want a right spirit in me. I want a clean spirit in me, a holy spirit. One that's not defiled with the things of this world. God, that's what I want. That's what David said. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would give us discernment for our own lives. Give us discernment, Lord, for the people that we're around. Give us discernment, Lord, the churches we go to. Lord, just help us and give us understanding of what's going on in these last days. And we pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.